Hello and welcome to Sophie and Co. I'm Sophie Shevardnadze. The men who witnessed the worst confrontation between Russia and the West and helped put an end to it. The last Soviet leader, Mikhail Gorbachev, prides himself on ending the Cold War. But is it starting again? Mr. Gorbachev himself is with me today to share his thoughts with us. The new Cold War is lurking on the horizon. As the confrontation between Russia and the West is stuck in a dead end, what can save the world from a new drawn-out standoff? Can the sides even begin to find common ground? And shall they find enough will for a long-awaited thaw? Mr. Gorbachev, thank you very much for finding the time to talk to us today. I haven't gone public for 18 months now. You recently said that the current situation is getting so intense that someone's nerves might just snap. Why is the threat of mutually assured destruction no longer a sufficient deterrent today? Well, I do not agree with those who say this, that the threat of nuclear destruction is no longer a sufficient deterrent. Today, we have a much better knowledge of what nuclear weapons actually are and what they can do. I'll give you one example. Just one intercontinental ballistic missile named Satan in the NATO classification, a very powerful missile of ours. This one missile alone carries 100 Chernobyls in it. And this is why I think everyone understands what an immensely destructive force it is. And we've had enough time to understand that. And now, now we need to be vigilant and careful to make sure it never gets into the hands of extremists of any kind. In your article, you also wrote that Europe needs its own Security Council. However, Europe already has OSCE. Does that mean that the OSCE has lost its purpose? The OSCE is... That is my answer. Although I wouldn't say that it lost its purpose. To say that would be to imply they are completely useless. However, the OSCE is still trying to do something. They're flaying around in Ukraine. Their observers are there and so on. This is all about a different thing. Whenever we talk about the nuclear arsenal, the levels of control and responsibility are the highest. We need to get back to it. We need to build a united Europe, a Europe that would be home for all. Whereas now, in this European home, we only get squabbles and arguments. When the German reunification was negotiated, the U.S. State Secretary pledged that NATO will not go an inch further east of Germany. Now, those talks were never translated into binding agreements. And now, when the emotions are running high, negotiating something like this in regards to Ukraine seems even less probable. So will NATO eventually be at Russian borders? That's all because the U.S. is trying hard to get there. And watching the U.S., Russia responds with some steps in return. Sometimes these are unnecessary steps. That's how all of this grows out of proportion. The thing is that the Americans are everywhere now. Today they are deploying missile defenses across all cities, along the borders. Tomorrow they are setting up new military bases. Heck, I know pretty well how many bases they used to have before. It's peanuts compared to what they're trying to do now. I gave an interview to the Time magazine a couple of days ago, and I told them, I don't really get you. A long time ago, Eisenhower told you to beware of the military-industrial complex. NATO seeks to interfere with everything and everywhere. It wants to expand beyond its designated territory. Eisenhower was a very serious man, a warrior. He went through everything that our country went through. He is the man whose judgment you can trust. So what is it that you're doing? Can't you just live without it? It's like America cannot live without its military industrial complex growing, weapon sales increasing and war costs soaring. Can't you live without it? And they answered, Yes, it looks like it. And I said, 
Then look at this case. This society is sick. It needs help. So why do you think NATO would want to expand to the east? That's its political culture. Its military culture. For example, in 1990, there was a summit for the European countries. A really great summit. So, they adopted a development plan for Europe. And it all looks like Europe is becoming the world's new driving force. It sets the new pace. So, President Bush delivers one speech, another one, yet another one, about the new world order, based on the experience of what is going on in Europe. And then Gorbachev says something along the same lines, after him. Pope John Paul II also says, Yes, we do need a new world order, which would be more stable, more fair, more everything, and so on and so forth. So everyone realized then that we arrived at the moment where there was an opportunity to move in the peaceful direction, the direction that the best people from basically all countries have dreamt of. And one of them was a certain American by the name of John Kennedy, the man who went through the Caribbean crisis and said, if you think that future peace should be Pax Americana, you're mistaken. It's either peace for people, for all the people, or no peace at all. That's exactly true. It's harsh. It's cruel. It's, that's the way it is. The inventors of nuclear power has also said that. One of them said that with the arrival of nuclear weapons, the world lost its immortality. And it all started with the Americans all of a sudden wanting to assert themselves. How come they did so? The Cold War was over. We put an end to it. Together, it was in fact a common victory shared by all nations. And yet, the Americans said, no way, we won it. We won. We won the Cold War. We did. Us. That's what we did. And it seems okay to say, oh, well, whatever. If you like to saying that, just go ahead. But this leads to something. If the Americans indeed won, they can make a conclusion. And they did go on to make that conclusion and started to say publicly, we don't need to change anything. We won. The world is at our feet. Why should we have to change anything? We don't need to change anything. Our policy is right. The most extreme thing they came up with, they began creating a new superpower, a super empire. America wanted to rule the world. The Americans lost their way. Any attempt to create a one-sided, one-polar world is just complete and utter nonsense. You suggested holding a Russia-U.S. summit because these countries bear... Yes, I did. ...particular responsibility. Neither Russia nor the U.S. responded. But if they wanted to resolve the crisis, surely they would have held this summit long ago. They are going to want to resolve it only when they feel the pressure from the civil society in the United States, here in Russia, and everywhere. It's clear that without civil society and its defined and organized nature, it's difficult to keep the hawks at bay. You were awarded the Nobel Peace Prize, and so was President Barack Obama. How do you feel about the fact that, in this regard, he's your colleague, in a sense that he's the member of the same club, so to speak? In this case, it was kind of like an advance. Such things happen in politics, too. One time, I was giving a lecture in St. Louis, and after I finished, a young man stood up and asked, Mr. President, what would you advise us Americans to do? And I asked him what he meant by that. And he said, you see how bad things are here? 
and they're getting worse. And I said, well, that's all new. All this time it was America that doled out advice for everyone, even though no one asked for it. No, I will not give you any advice. You Americans have everything at your disposal to figure this out. And so a second man stood up and said, I would like to support my colleague. Please answer the question. You have gone through all of this. We need to do something about the situation too, I said. Very well. I will not give you a plan or a recipe. I just think that the United States needs its own perestroika. After that, the audience of about 10 or 15,000 people that were there gave me a standing ovation. Two years later, Barack Obama was elected president. So for the most part, the people are changing. The main thing is that Americans don't want to die. Why is it that the United States opts for using planes, warships, missiles, without deploying ground forces? That's because the society won't let them anymore. It will start putting pressure on it immediately. Mikhail Sergeyevich, we are now going to take a brief pause and return. When we come back, we'll continue talking to USSR's first and last president, Mikhail Gorbachev. We'll talk Crimea and also we'll ask him, who is America afraid of? Stay with us. And we're back with Mikhail Gorbachev, USSR's first and last president. He also said in an interview that the U.S. acts as the world's policeman and thinks that alone can protect the world. But who is America's enemy? Who are they protecting against? I don't think they have anybody to protect against. They just need an enemy to come back to their old policy of pressure. They can't live without it. They are still enslaved by their old policy. That's why America has to be stopped. It should be stopped in a friendly manner, as a partner. Let's be realistic. America is a phenomenon we can't ignore, and it has certain rights. Its word carries weight. An American can make decisions that benefit the whole world. Yes, Americans can lead. They want to lead? Yes, they can lead. But they should do so in a partnership with other nations. Because the only kind of leadership that is possible today is leadership through partnership. Um. If I get it right, you also think that Americans want troubles in Europe to continue. But why would U.S. benefit from disagreement among European nations? Whenever tensions are high, whenever there's instability in a certain country or throughout the region, it's an opportunity for them to intervene. That's my frank answer to your question. I'm quite familiar with this policy from my own experience. This is bad for the United States itself in the first place. In my lectures, I ask the following question. Do you really think you'll be happy with the role of the world's policeman? And I say, I'm pretty sure that you won't. And the audience applauds. And in all of my public appearances, I ask these questions probing public opinion. No, the Americans do not want war, but it's not easy for them. With society that they have, it has developed certain powerful mechanisms. I say they need a perestroika, I mean it. They can call it any name they want, the American way. All right, so you're saying that the U.S. benefits from turmoil in Europe because it gives the U.S. an excuse to interfere. But if that's so, why is the USA trying to shift the responsibility for resolving the Ukrainian crisis in its entirety to Russia? But of course they are. But that is the American way, shifting responsibility. And their mass media will provide all-round support. 
They will prove anything that's needed, however improbable. If they need to prove that a devil incarnate appear, they will, if that's what it takes. I'd like to touch upon the sanctions and other current events. The South Stream had to be shut down, sale of Mistral ships is suspended. I mean, all this causes damage to companies, including European ones. Why is the EU willing to harm itself in its relationships with Russia? Well, just the other day, 60 major figures spoke in Germany, including former presidents, as well as Mr. Genscher, Mr. Schroeder, and Mr. Mangold, and so on. I knew most of them. Celebrities spoke as well, and they all said unanimously that we shouldn't be doing our business in such a way as to damage our relationship with Russia. This is all happening because Chancellor Merkel finds herself in a very difficult situation for the reason of Germany's dependence on the United States. As for the rest of European nations, Germany can handle them. At one point, Americans cut oil prices, and the oil prices plunged, and we lose dollars because of the measures that had already been taken by Americans according to their arrangements with Saudi Arabia. So this is yet another way of putting pressure. Some time ago I spoke at a conference in Passau, West Germany, which we held together with Mr. Kohl when he was still well. The theme of that conference was individual and the united Europe. It turned out we both believed that without Russia there could be no world order that would meet the interests of all nations, right? Then a fellow stood up and said, if that's your opinion, then you should accept Russia to the European Union. None of us was ready for that, especially my friend the Chancellor. He leaped up, knocking the table over almost and yelled, what do you think you're saying? This cannot be done. No way. Why did he say no way? Because without Russia, Germany has a lot of weight in the EU. It's got a very strong position. So when Russia shows up, you'll have to accommodate that. Russia will have enough arguments to defend sovereign, strong positions. President Putin has recently said, and you also confirmed it, that the Ukrainian and Crimean issue was just a pretext to impose sanctions against Russia, and that the West would have come up with something to do that anyways. I tend to share that opinion. So if you share this opinion, it means that the US and the West want to be Russia's enemies, and that they would have imposed sanctions anyway? It was they who declared us enemies. So whether they wanted it or not, they did. Not all of them, though. I've heard many of them, to the contrary, defending us, saying that Russia is right. In the course of Russia's long history, all kinds of things had been done to Russia, but no one managed to bring this country to its knees. Let's recall Napoleon or Hitler. And nobody will. But you know what can happen now? If the war begins, considering the kinds of weapons that exist now, then... Is there a threat of such a war? I believe there is no threat of war right now, but we see the escalation. We can basically say that Cold War has started, or resumed. That's what's happening now. So, we have to be alert. Let's talk about Crimea. Um, I'm going to quote you right here. Earlier, Crimea was merged with Ukraine and Soviet laws, to be more exact by the Communist Party laws, without asking the people, and now the people have decided to correct that mistake. If that's true, why doesn't the West accept it or understand it? because it's not to the advantage of the West. Historically, this position hasn't been beneficial for the West. I'm always trying to say what I know, to tell the truth in all of my articles, speeches and interviews. So, in the times of the Russian Empire, before the Bolshevik Revolution, 
there was not such a state as Ukraine. There was Malorossia, or Little Russia. You would know that, right? Catherine the Great's lovers used to rule it, one after another. Oh, women are so cunning. Under Lenin, the state of Ukraine was established, regardless of anything that's been said about Ukraine's living at that time. Ukraine flourished as a state. It had a powerful industry and culture. Its leaders were represented in the Politburo as key figures. It produced general secretaries, leaders of the party, and so on. But then passions started to run high. And when passions are revolving around women or having power, it's hard to get things right. But Mr. Gorbachev, when you were general secretary or the first president of the USSR, why didn't you bring Crimea back as part of Russia? You could have done it just like Nikita Khrushchev did the opposite. Why should I have done that while the Soviet Union still existed? And the boundaries within the Soviet Union were the same as symbolic forces between two neighbors' gardens. The biggest fight would have happened if your geese wandered into your neighbor's garden. But from the state viewpoint, it wasn't divided or guarded. So that's how it used to be. General Secretary Khrushchev thought he would appease Ukraine. He used to be the first secretary of Ukraine. So he did appease them, so to say, by handing Crimea over to them. But a lot later, in 1991, when we had the negotiations about the future of the USSR, the Belovish Accords that were dissolving the Union were introduced. And there were all these meetings, and the signed accords were approved. So the question is, how could they possibly have approved it in that way? Someone representing Russia tried to speak up something along the lines of, well, what about our people? They live across the Union. What happens to them, etc.? And then astronaut Sevastyanov, he was deputy, so the astronaut stood up and said, listen, what are you talking about? Gorbachev will be gone from the Kremlin tomorrow. That's what the most important thing is. You've had such a long and intense political career. What would you now consider your greatest achievement of all? Perestroika and everything that's related to it, even though it was interrupted, was never actually completed. Let me count here. We achieved freedom, glasness or openness, freedom to travel abroad, religious freedom, and so on. I won't list all of them. And finally, disarmament. It made people sigh with relief across the globe, particularly in the developed countries. They were all digging shelters in case of nuclear war, which could have broken out at any moment. So that has been done. And we completed that part. People were granted freedom of choice in Central and Eastern Europe. Germany was reunited. Relationship with China was resumed. It was fascinating. That's already enough for a good result. But I do regret that I never managed to lead this project to completion. What we should do now is roll back and resume from those positions. We should come to agreements and keep moving forward, but all players should participate in this process. As I've written in the article, I suggested creating structures and institutions that would be in the hands of the people. And that's it. Thank you very much. How many questions did you write? Thanks again. <laughs>